Coming up on this week's show, a new Commodore VIC-20 remake is on the way. The PlayStation 2 DVD gets hacked after 20 years. And we talk retro with the man behind the Raspberry Pi, Eben Upton. This week's show is brought to you by our friends at Gymshark. Hello and welcome to the Retro Hour podcast, episode number 231, your weekly dose of retro gaming and technology news with me, Dan Wood. Me, Ravi Abbott. And me, Joe Fox. And it's time to get our retro on for the next hour or so, reminiscing about classic video games, bringing you up to speed with everything that's been happening in the world of retro gaming over the last week, and of course, bringing you a very special guest. Now, I don't know about you guys, I've actually been really excited about this week's episode. Being that I am a massive fan of the Raspberry Pi, I'd probably rate it up there in like my favourite machines of all time, just because of how versatile and affordable they are. And people might be looking at this thinking, well, the Raspberry Pi only came out in the last 10 years. Why are you talking about that on a retro podcast? But fact is, I think the Raspberry Pi has actually changed the retro gaming scene quite a lot. Who hasn't got a Raspberry Pi? You know, they've sold... <laughs> you Apart from one Joe. Joe. <laughs> I'll give you one, Joe. I've got loads. <laughs> yeah, have one spare. They've sold over 30 million units, which is absolutely insane. And this is a, a tiny single board computer, basically. And there's so many different versions of them and so many cool things that you can do with them. So we're going to talk to Eben Upton, who is actually the founder of the Raspberry Pi Foundation. Now, he's actually got an interesting history as well, because um, the Raspberry Pi is made in Cambridge. And if you know anything about the British computer scene back in the 80s, of course, that was where companies like Sinclair and Acorn were based. And Acorn in particular were a big influence on the design of the Raspberry Pi. I mean, essentially, the idea of it was to make a modern day BBC Micro, wasn't it? Yeah, it's like a real kind of British success story as well, because, you know, people thought, oh, wouldn't this be successful? You know, maybe a few people have it. And then it just got took up by the mainstream and kind of spread around the world. I've got one at home inside a monster joystick that I use as a MAME cabinet. I've got one that I use as like um, a Kodi box, you know, like a media center. They're just really versatile machines and they can be used as well. Gaming people often use them for emulation and uh, to build just really cool projects. I mean, there's a lot of robotics and stuff. I'm going to talk about a really interesting story about a a flight sim that's uh, using a Raspberry Pi in a very retro kind of way. So Eben Upton is going to be our special guest. We'll be getting the story of what inspired the Raspberry Pi. He'll be coming up on the show in the next 15 minutes. Before we do, let's give a big thank you to our very good friends at Gymshark, who've brought you this week's show. And Gymshark are a really cool company. They're actually a conditioning brand dedicated to creating functional training gear and designing innovative performance technologies and building passionate, empowered communities around it. And they've actually got a really interesting backstory. They were formed less than a decade ago in a garage in Birmingham here in the UK. And in the last 10 years, they've emerged as a leading brand in their industry with a worldwide family of over 15 million people in over 150 countries. The idea is they want to unite the conditioning community. And you may have seen them working with lots of creators and athletes like Ross Edgley, Ryan Garcia, Matt Does Fitness, Katie Taylor, and many more as well. And uh, we've actually got some Gymshark gear that we've been using over the last couple of weeks. I know, Joe, you're kind of a, a fitness buff of the Retro Hour crew. Well, I wouldn't call myself a fitness buff, but I do. More like than me and Ravi. <laughs> <laughs> More than you and Ravi, yeah. I'm at, I'll agree with that. You know what? I've been wearing their uh, tank tops, feeling very sexy. But no, honestly, they've really, <laughs> really, really helped me. I work out in the garden at the moment with lockdown. Um, and it's just, I know it sounds a little bit daft, but it's just inspired me just to start working out again. I'm a bigger guy. I've been really comfortable in their gear. Really, really breathable, um, you know, getting into the nitty gritty. I'm a sweaty guy as well. And <laughs> it just feels good not to be working out in like Primark jogging bottoms, like some actual nice, good quality, breathable clothes. Yeah, also I, I do a bit of yoga as well. And it's just really nice to kind of have this gear on. I've I've, I've walked around and I've noticed Gymshark stuff on other stuff because I'm totally out of trend with the fashion at the moment. <laughs> but yeah, it seems to be really popular and uh, it's kind of helping me you know, just get out there and exercise. And Ravi's attractive neighbour was quite impressed that you were in Gymshark. 
Yeah, man. <laughs> <laughs> so, ooh, they're nice clothes, Ravi. And actually, I think you know what you said then, Joe, as well, about having these clothes and like being inspired by it. I mean, I'm actually wearing one of their hoodies right now. We were the same over the weekend. I thought I was going to bike ride for an hour, you know, because I was just wearing the gear. It, it did really help. So we want you to go and check out Gymshark for yourself. And you'll be helping out the podcast by doing this, of course. All you have to do is nip onto their website. Have a look right now, gymshark.com forward slash the retro hour. Find out how you would wear their clothing. Have a look at their range. Help out the podcast by doing it. Gym gymshark.com forward slash the retro hour thanks to our good friends at gymshark now this is a headline that i didn't think i'd see in 2020 we're getting a brand new nintendo wii game and one for the wii u as well and it's a game that we love shakedown hawaii when i saw this when dan and ravi sent this over to me i thought here we go you know just dance 2021 coming out on the wii and the wii u but no it's uh it's shakedown hawaii uh shakedown hawaii which is a, a game that we've all enjoyed over the last couple of months um and it's just insane it's coming to the wii and the wii u uh, we've not got a lot of information about the wii u release but essentially from what i understand the developers it kind of started out as a bit of a laugh just to see if they could get it running on the wii and they did so they thought, well, why not release it? But it's only coming out in Europe, uh, limited to 3,000 copies from what I understand. Yeah, so we had um, Brian uh, Provinciano on the podcast from V Blank Entertainment, and mm. uh, these were the guys that produced it. And from what I saw when we were talking about it ages ago, there was a, a Wii version that was meant to come out. So okay. I think they might have got the licensing or something like that ages ago and then finally kind of got it done. But interestingly, yeah. this is uh, with Nintendo Europe, so it's a proper official release. And I reckon these are going to be well rare, aren't they? They're going to yeah. be like the last two games on the Wii um, and the Wii U. You know? Yeah, 100%. So the reason, according to the article, is it's coming out on the Wii, because like you say, in Europe, the licensing is still there to release games in, on which the Wii. Which is crazy. So I guess games like, like Just Dance and stuff like that, which come out every year, but in America and the rest of the world, the license is gone. You can't release games on the Wii anymore, which is why it's coming out on the Wii U over there. But like Ravi says, you know, I think this is, it's going to be 3,000 units. So it's going to become, you know, like the last game of the Wii. Like, you know, in 20 years time, this might be one of the Holy Grail games. Well, I always thought Breath of the Wild was going to be the last one on the Wii U. So yes. it's cool, cool, cool to see other titles coming out. The, yeah. the value of uh, your, your Wii U edition of Breath of the Wild just plummeted now. <laughs> <laughs> just hit the floor and it's a great game as well if you haven't played it i mean it's um it's kind of like a grand theft auto kind of uh, inspired game isn't it lots of retro things inspire shakedown hawaii so i think anyone listening to our podcast will enjoy playing it what blew my mind when i was reading this article is that the wii was launched in 2006 it's already 14 years old and i remember you know when That's they were crazy. like remember when they were impossible to get hold of wii's and everyone wanted one yeah, I remember that. And the Wii Fit board, the balance board as well, just like like gold dust. <laughs> and now you walk into like cash converters and like half the shop is like Wii Fit boards and stuff, yeah. isn't it? So. <laughs> the shelves are made out of Wii Fit boards. <laughs> so <laughs> they've got nothing bad to do with them. I do think that's a great game to be like the last release on both of those platforms, though. So um, yeah, very fitting end to uh, two really good platforms. Check down Hawaii if you want to get hold of a copy of it. I'm sure we'll be ordering information coming up soon. And it is physical releases. It's going to be boxed, you know, the, the proper discs that are pressed and everything too. So um, I'll link that up on all the other stories in our show notes at theretrohour.com. And here's another story I didn't think we'd be talking about this year. The PlayStation 2 has finally been, by the looks of this, completely hacked. That means you can be able to play burnt games on it without needing any modification to your system. Yeah, this is absolutely insane. So MVG's done a fantastic video on this. But um, the way this works is we've covered before the Dreamcast boot CD. And the Dreamcast boot CD worked because it overrided the copy protection with a mill CD, it, it, it pretended that it was a mill CD, which was this format of CD that was kind of left on the Dreamcast. Well, this guy's been working for absolute years to get it working. He's called uh, C-Turt, and he's been trying to get this working on the PlayStation 2. But how can you do a boot disc there? Well, the way that they do it is when you put a DVD into the PlayStation 2, detects the disc right. so it, it's that detection area so when it's kind of just looking at the disc and going what is this disc it then tricks it into being able to put unsigned code 
on there. So he's kind of gone in there. If you see this MVG video, it's amazing. He shows how he extracted one of the ROMs, reversed engineered all of this, studied all of this. But essentially what you can do is you can put a disc in or put your DVD in, uh, this modified disc, and then load up unsigned code straight away. And they may be able to do um, boot disks eventually. So you could have this code at the beginning of the disc, and then you put your title in. So it's all just like on one disc, like those uh, GD-ROM rips were. And it's always been incredibly hard to kind of mod the PlayStation 2. You've always needed these stuff like free boot and all these kind of other modifications where this one just makes it fantastically simple. No going inside the system or any of that. You just get the disc, put it in, and it boots. Yeah, I mean, back then That's it would insane. be like, you know, if you want to mod your PlayStation 2 originally, that was kind of the era of having physical mod chips at first, wasn't it? You'd have to solder in. And I remember they were really complex to do originally. And then stuff like Freeman Boot, I, you know, I've, I've Freeman Booted one of my PlayStation 2s, one of my fat PS2s. And that was pretty simple, but then you still need to get a memory card that's actually got the code on there off eBay or something. Not something you can do without somebody else's help. But by the looks of this, I mean, it does sound very much like the exploit that was found in the Dreamcast, like he said. Only thing is, it actually took 20 years for someone to actually figure this version, this hack out on the on the PlayStation 2. Also, they're saying that this might work on anything that has a DVD drive on it. Wow. So, you know, original Xbox... You can have any any of the consoles may be able to kind of use this exploit changed in a in a different way to fit them. It's great as well because I mean he's actually got a little homebrew version of Tetris that he launches on the PlayStation Two, and the saying that like you said, Ravi, that they're eventually going to be able to put this code, I guess, before pirated kind of games or whatever you know that you can download uh, or abandonware. I think we call them these days. And what what's exciting for me though is it kind of opens up the the door to playstation 2 homebrew yeah and and, and releases again yeah. you know unofficial releases uh it wouldn't stop somebody uh you know an indie studio kind of creating one of these and putting it out i'm not sure about the legal issues I, and, I, and i'm not sure how much co- sony kind of care about uh running something on a 20 year old console i'm not sure <laughs> We'll have to see. Yeah, but I think it's awesome. I mean, it's it's kind of cool that, you know, what the PlayStation 2 is essentially sold as, you know, because a lot of people bought them as DVD players, <laughs> eventually will become kind of, you know, if it was discovered earlier, that could have been its big downfall. You know, the Dreamcast was, I mean, that was hacked very shortly after release. If this had been found, like, back in 2000, 2001, that would have changed a lot, I think. Oh, totally, yeah. I, w- I wish I had a time machine and I could just go back and put this disc in and watch everybody's jaw just hit the floor. <laughs> then, then you come back to 2020 and Sony's just gone because Ravi Bancroft did that. <laughs> <laughs> now, we're going to be talking about the Raspberry Pi very soon. And uh, one of my favourite stories that we've, I think we've ever talked about on this podcast was a few years ago, um, we're chatting about this guy who turned one of those Tomy turning turbo dashboard toys that we all had as kids he actually put a little um raspberry pi in there and ran outrun on it and i thought that was amazing and now it looks like uh, the same guy's back he's this time he's done a flight sim so is this like a like a homebrew flight sim flight sim or is this like a game he's grabbed because this looks insane like you say it's it's like one of those little toys you have when you're a kid but obviously it's a flying one and it's got the joystick and everything on it but like there's this insane little screen on it with the game, and it just, it's, I can't even figure out what it is. <laughs> well, I, I'm not massively into my flight sims, if I'm honest. And looking at this game, mm. it looks a bit like, you know, Afterburner kind of game by the looks of it, I think. Yeah. Um, but apparently, he's used a toy uh, called a Sky Fighter F16 tabletop, and this was made by Deval. I'm guessing back in the 80s by the looks of it, but it's actually based this around ripping out the innards of it, putting like a a more modern screen in there, a Raspberry Pi 3A+, Plus, which is obviously really small. And then by the looks of it, I imagine it's just, you know, he's running emulators on it, so you could probably run something like Afterburner on here as well. But what's really good is he's actually mapped all the controls that were in there to play the original, I imagine, very primitive game. You can actually control the Raspberry Pi with the the controls on the little, little plane, which is pretty cool. So all those little buttons and stuff actually do stuff, which is insane. Yeah, which is like... But, you know, you remember, like, I don't know if you had one of those Tomy things as a kid. They were like, you know, in yeah. your mind, they were like driving a real car. But you look back at them, I mean, you know, they didn't even really have graphics. It was just like moving things, wasn't it? It wasn't like in any way, shape or form comparable to playing a video game. But when you actually get something like this in there, 
that is kind of what you always dreamed of as a kid, having it like this. It would have been incredible. And also, kind of like, incredible. flight sim fans love loads of buttons, joysticks. I used to remember in the 90s, like, the flight sim joysticks would be insanely <laughs> big with hundreds of buttons and kind of really weird holding positions and stuff. So I can imagine this appealing to a, a, a very niche, uh, portable flight sim fan. What's that um, that Xbox original game with the mechs? <laughs> Where oh, you get God, the huge yeah. controller. Like a big tank kind it of controller. Yeah. me of that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's like the size of like your TV stand at home, isn't it? It's massive. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think it's really cool. I mean, flight sims have always been a genre that interests me, but I'm ju- I just haven't got the patience to get into them, I don't think. No, my brother growing up, he was always into like flight simulator 97, 98, 99 and all them and we lived quite close to an airport, which was on there as well. And he used to be like, come on, look, I've landed at the airport around the corner and all this. And I was just like, boring. <laughs> <laughs> I, I used to just get sick because I'd play like six frames per second Amiga flight sims. <laughs> and just be like, I can't do more than 10 minutes on this. Oh, yeah, God, I, I just sit there generally like you're bashing the keyboard, just trying to figure out how to take off. <laughs> then like getting <laughs> shot down within about 20 seconds normally when I play flight sim. Re- Retro Man Cave, he's a flight sim guy. Yeah, we'll have... he, he knows his sims. We'll, yeah. we'll have to get him a oh, teacher. You'll be, you'll be unsubscribing after we've done this. <laughs> <laughs> he'll be slagging off the flight sims. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, I, I love anything like this. And especially, you know, we're going to be talking more about the Raspberry Pi in a moment. Just another example of what a versatile platform it is and how it can, like, you know, that, like I said, bring childhood dreams to life. You will, would have loved something like this when you were a kid speaking of bringing childhood dreams to life as well what about getting the ultimate commodore vic 20 now of course we've done a couple of episodes about the commodore vic 20 before actually um we had uh, neil harris on and michael tomchek we did a full episode with him talking about the history of that machine and the, the vic 20 is i mean the commodore 64 was obviously the big one but the vic 20 was the first home computer to sell one million units and you know it really did start an entire revolution of home computers that you could have at home that were affordable. So, you know, you think back to that era, stuff like the Apple II, I mean, they were, you know, thousands of pounds to buy. The VIC-20 was actually an affordable machine. And for many people, it was their first home computer. Well, the team behind the Commodore 64 Mini and the 64 Retro Games Limited have announced they're going to be bringing out a new machine called the VIC-20, the wonder computer of the 80s, in October this year. So essentially what this is, if you saw their uh, Commodore 64 Maxi they did, by the looks of it, it's really just a Maxi in Commodore VIC-20 colours and with the keyboard font. It, it must have kind of been easy for them to do once they got this case now. they all, all they need to really do is change a couple of logos, but also add new software in there. So... The software before was by Calanto, and uh, it seemed really nice. And from what I'm seeing in the trailer as well, the software looks pretty good on this. And that's for all the menus and, like, pausing the game and kind of playing internally. That's one thing I'm wondering, because it comes with the same joystick that was kind of inspired by the Competition Pro. Um, I'm reading an article here on Forbes, actually, and they make a good point. A lot of people were complaining that those joysticks were a little bit flimsy. You know, people were snapping them quite easily, and there's like uh, lots of YouTube videos on how to make them a bit sturdier. So hopefully they've kind of followed that advice and made them a little bit less easy to break. But I do remember that the the 64, the Maxi, does actually have a VIC-20 mode on it already. So I'm wondering whether this is literally just a different case and the, the exact same hardware inside, which would make sense if it is. Yeah, it's a bit of a cop out though, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> I'll say it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm looking at the list of games as well that are included, and there are, you know, the 64 games on there, and more than half the list of games is Commodore 64 games. So you've got stuff like California mm. Games on there, um, Bear Bother, Fire Lord, you know, all the same ones that were on the 64, actually. So... Yeah, I mean, the thing about it, everyone complained back when that came out that, you know, oh, my favourite Commodore 64 game's not on there. You can actually just put a USB flash drive in and play all your VIC-20 and 64 ROMs straight off it anyway. So, you know, the actual included list of software isn't such a big deal. So but also, really- you can mod these as well. So I've seen a lot of mods online of people using these cases, oh, okay. putting original stuff in there, and kind of they're they're, they're quite nice to uh, mod as well. But it does it does seem to me that it's kind of a bit of an extension of another product, yeah. Just to kind of get a bit more <laughs> cash out of it. But you know, if people want it, and uh, there's a lot of Vic Twenty enthusiasts out there, um, it may be a little niche. And let's be honest, Joe. If they release like you know a, a Mega Drive Mini Two. 
that just looked like a oh god, <laughs> looked, yeah. like a, looked like a looked like a Mega Drive two. You'd buy it even if it was identical to the first one, wouldn't you? Hundred <laughs> percent, same games, everything. No, it's for people like it's Joe. Released the plastic uh, Tower of Power. Got <laughs> <laughs> me there, boys. <laughs> and I, I do think you know if you are a Vic Twenty enthusiast, if for the sake of a hundred quid, just having a freshly made new case and a replica of the original keyboard. I mean, for a lot of people, that's going to be worth it in itself, I think. So if you want to find out more about that, it's coming out in October. I'll put the link to Amazon in our show notes at theretrohour.com. Now, before we chat to Eben Upton all about the Raspberry Pi, you found this um, <laughs> cool little story about civilization. Yeah, so I'm a, I'm a big Civ player, and uh, Gandhi has always been one of the most brutal <laughs> players to play against. And... <laughs> Everybody wonders, like, Gandhi, wait, he was a pacifist. He was an icon of peace worldwide. Why Why is he a violent player? Did they put this in as a kind of initial joke? And this has gone all the way up to Civilization VI. So, you know, he's he's still very, very aggressive, Gandhi is. And I the reason... I think I know the story behind this. And yeah, can, so I, the... can, I, can I explain what my side of it, and then you can correct me? Yeah, go for it, go for it. So from what I understand, I don't know, I'm not too familiar with the Civilization games, but the first Civilization Gandhi was in, am I right in thinking his aggression level was like zero out of 10? But what happened, there was a glitch in the original game he was in where he, you can do something that makes somebody's, an, an, an enemy's aggression lower, but because it can't go any lower than zero, it then goes back to the top aggression that's exactly it yeah it makes so, him his most aggressive like the most possibly aggressive character that can be and everybody loved it so they just kept it going is that right so that's exactly it so when you get to the point that india adopts democracy yeah gandhi's score was one right but it gets lowered to minus one and uh, there was it minus one didn't exist so it just shoves him up to 256 <laughs> <laughs> and he, he gets nuke nuke friendly you know he's he's gets really aggressive and uh they thought you know this is legendary why, why don't we kind of leave this in the game and i thought there's a nice little article kind of explaining that so yeah i bet if you're one of those original players and like you you encountered that bug you know back in like the early 90s when it came out you're like what is going on here because it must have took players completely by surprise yeah like um i've, I've played so many nuclear matches against him <laughs> <laughs> you'd think like maybe maybe they'd have different leaders that would be into that but yeah, yeah four in the morning getting nuked by Gandhi. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. it's it's why civilization is such a good game because it has these things that would never happen in the real world <laughs> Well, listen, we're going to do some retro chat with Evan Upton in just a minute. Now, before we do, let's take a moment to give a huge thank you to our very loyal supporters who are there in the Retro Hour Club helping us out on Patreon. Now, of course, we, we talked about this over the last couple of weeks. The goal is eventually we want to get our studio built and you're going to keep this show going. We've got some big plans for the podcast when everything eventually gets back to normal and we can all meet up again. It feels like ages ago since we last met. It's been like, what, three or four months now since we last met? Like, last time months. I've... Last time I went into town was to do that last episode months ago. Yeah. I think we recorded like three episodes back to back yeah. in the last week of February, maybe God. in the studio. That is crazy. Wow. <laughs> Which is crazy. And Joe hasn't had a haircut <laughs> since then, so he's just hair now. I haven't. <laughs> I started saw him when he came round to mine to pick up something, and he, it was like a caveman at the door. <laughs> I do look a bit like a caveman at the moment. <laughs> well, we have got a patron running at the moment. If you'd like to help out the podcast, we appreciate, you know, times are hard for a lot of people right now. So, not obviously, the show will always be free, but if you would like to help us out on our mission to uh, get our own studio built and keep this show going in the future, we have got a patron. And, of course, for doing that, you can join us in a couple of weeks' time now that we are into July. July. won't be long until we do another patrons hangout i'll of course put all the links in the uh, patron page as well and for backing us on there you will get a mention on a future episode in the retro hour hall of fame just like this week thank you so much to chris hull canny ollie dean raymond montalban and terje hoyback who all made donations into the running of the show. Thank you so much, guys. We really appreciate that. And if you'd like to do the same, you'll find everything you need to know to back us on Patreon on our website at theretrohour.com. Right, then we're going to get the story of the Raspberry Pi and chat lots of retro with the man behind the Raspberry Pi, Eben Upton, next on the Retro Hour podcast. 
You're listening to the Retro Hour podcast and it's time to welcome on this week's very special guest. Now, there is one modern machine that we talk about on this podcast so much and that, of course, is the Raspberry Pi. A machine that's so versatile and got so many different uses, but really, it's been taken under the wing of the retro community. I mean, I've seen them in, you know, arcade machines... Um, dedicated retro setups, media centres, and it's our pleasure to welcome the man behind the Raspberry Pi project. Welcome to the Retro Hour podcast, Evan Upton. Good to be here. Appreciate you joining us, Evan. Now, before we get into um, a chat about the Raspberry Pi, I thought it might be quite nice to find out a little bit about your personal background with computers. I mean, do you remember where your interest started? Um, Yeah, so I have been using computers since I was three years old, I think. Um, I had a I had a go on a mini computer when I was three uh, at my dad's work, and I played a game called Hunt the Wampus, uh, which is a it's a kind of this it's a the, the world's simplest text adventure where you run around this little maze and shoot arrows at this uh, invisible creature called the Wampus. So so I've been I've been kind of playing around with computers for a very long time. Um, the first computer I ever really wrote a computer program for, of course, was the BBC Micro. Um, like a lot of people my age. Was that the uh, first computer you got at home then? The first one uh, yeah. you could sit down with and kind of program on? Yeah. Um, I, um, I, I Obviously, I encountered it at school. Again, like a lot of other people, you had this kind of beige box sitting in the corner of, of the classroom um, that was generally not used for computer programming, right? It was used for running French teaching applications and, and, and stuff on. It was a, it was a general purpose computer. Um, but yeah, I got kind of hooked in. I got, got hooked on it that way. Um, then saved my pennies and bought a very battered old second-hand BBC Micro to have in the corner of my bedroom. Uh, and that was my, I guess that was the machine that I used for probably four or five years as a child. And they were quite expensive machines as well, so you must have been saving for a while. Uh, it was a very beaten up old one. So it was a, uh, and I bought this in 1988, I think maybe 89. So it was, it was very old then uh, and very fragile. Um, it cost me £220 um but including a hard drive and uh, no, a floppy drive right? including a uh, a double-sided 80 track floppy drive um and yeah i love that machine you know i had to hit it you had to hit it to get it to turn on you had to hit it over the power supply <laughs> and then flick the power switch very quickly um i still don't know what that was i still can't, haven't got like a mental theory as to what kind of been going on there but it, it seemed to work um and i god i love that machine because i remember using bbc micros at school and i think you know the experience was typical for a lot of kids that went to school in like the mid to late eighties, that you know you, you had the, like the cub monitors, the five point twenty five inch floppy disks, um, the logo turtle. I remember using as well. I mean, what kind of memories have you got of using the BBC Micro at school? Um, so I again, like I think a lot of people, I I played a game called L, a mathematical adventure. I don't know if if you, if you remember that one. Yeah, it was sort of a maths teaching adventure game that was uh, was rolled out. So I had a. Um, I think I ended up spending a maths lesson a week for a year playing L. I think I got a little bit ahead. Uh, and so I, I, they, they, they had me play L for an hour a week, an hour a week for a year. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of, um, a lot of just educational, you know, sort of maths, maths games, language, language tutors, all that sort of stuff. Uh, they didn't really seem to have, I don't think there were enough of them. They never seemed to get used for uh, word processing, right? Because there weren't really enough of them um, uh, for, for, for um, more than one child in a class to be using one at any given time. Uh, but it was a, there was a massive ecosystem, the Beeb in particular, massive ecosystem of educational software. Um, because they had stuff like the Domesday Project, which was an absolutely fantastic kind of recreation of the uh, Doomsday book. Um, on Laserdisc. So uh, did you ever get to experience that? I did at a, not in our school. I, there's no way I think our school could have run to a Laserdisc player. But um, no, I remember I went to uh, some conference for children and they had one in the corner and you could go and find your hometown. You know, I had a whole map of Britain and you could go and find your hometown and then find the information it had about your hometown. It was, it was amazing, right? Uh, and I know there's been a lot of work happened since then on kind of preserving that because it's a really interesting data set. And what got you into programming then? Do you remember like the first things you were working on when you were coding? So I had a friend called Martin Brown who could write these little two-line computer programs on his, he had an Acorn Electron because the, the kind of cut down BBC Micro. He had an Electron at home and he could write those two-line programs, input, what is your name, uh, N dollar, uh, print, hello, N dollar. Um, and I really, really didn't like the idea that my friend could do this thing and I couldn't do it. Um, and so I, I, I got into got into programming um, got into writing games, you know, wrote a lot of games. So I was really, as a kid, I was a games programmer. 
and yeah, spent ages writing games first in BBC Basic, uh, then in 6502 uh, Machine Code. Because of course, the lovely thing about the BB is it has a built-in um, 6502 assembler. Uh, it's, a, it's, it's kind of a full development environment for the whole of the machine, not just the basic bit. Um, and then I got an Amiga uh, and did 68,000, uh, again, games uh, in 68,000 assembler. Uh, there because the only uh, that didn't come with the uh, that didn't come with the tools, but the only tool I could afford was an assembler. Do you uh, think that the Beeb kind of holds a special place in everybody's heart? Because the, after the Beeb, everybody was into different systems. There was a lot of rivalry, but everybody was using it at school in Britain at the same time. So they all had that kind of connection with the machine. Yeah, that's right. I think as a home computer, of course, there was the Beeb versus. Um, Spectrum versus C64 kind of dynamic, um, uh, just as there was then the Amiga versus ST uh, versus consoles um, dynamic a bit later on. Uh, but you're right. I think it's the, the only time that there's ever been kind of a common platform um, that there, until the PC came to dominate everything. It, it, it was really the only time that there was a common platform that everyone in some environment have some experience of using. And you kind of touched on that then. I mean, it was, you know, often known as the era of the bedroom programmer. I mean, do you think machines back then encouraged the user to program them a lot more than they did after? Yes, because they boot into basic, right? They encourage you, if you don't want to be a programmer, the first thing you have to do is choose not to be a programmer. If you want to load a tape, the first thing you've got to do is type a little tiny bit of basic in to load something off a tape. Um, and, and that kind of, that dynamic that then flipped over with a modern computer, and this is what we're trying to get away from with Raspberry Pi, um, the, with a modern computer, you have to decide that you want to be a programmer. You have to go and dis- download a copy of Python and become a programmer. Um, in those days, you had to decide not to be one. And I think that led to a massive difference in the fraction of people who, who got involved in some way. Yeah, you're right, because even the people with kind of no knowledge in, of programming at all would still know, you know, 20 go to 10, or they'd know all the really simple kind of commands that they were all taught at school as well. So it's good to be getting back to that original style of kind of computing and getting in there with programming. Yeah, you could all write that 10 print, I'm the best, 20 go to 10. Or, you know, this this whole thing with typing 10, print something quite filthy, 20 go to 10, and you go into Dixon's and type it into all the machines and then run down the line and hit enter on all the machines and run out the door. Uh, and then watch the watch the star frantically rebooting all the machines to get the get the stuff off the screen. You know, that was fun. I'm glad it wasn't just me that did that in Dixon's. Yeah, it must have been a miserable time. I think the 1980s were a really miserable time to, uh, to work for <laughs> Dixon's, you know. And it wasn't just a tiny niche of hardcore geeks that could do that level of program because it's very satisfying. You know, it's, you know, even if you never learn anything else, even if you never go beyond that, it's incredibly satisfying to be able to make your computer do that. But you've spoken before about your love for the Amiga. I actually watched a video um, before we started recording where um, you had your Amiga 600 and you were talking about that. I mean, what's kind of your Amiga story then? All my friends had Amigas. So in terms of the Amiga versus ST thing, I think I was always going to be an Amiga kid. Um, there, there is a little bit of a, some, I think that there's something in the UK about, um, there, there are BBC and then Amiga people, and there are Spectrum and NST people, and a lot of it's about how much money your family were prepared to spend on a computer, in that the ST and the Spectrum were 100 quid or more cheaper. Um, I was a BBC Amiga guy, but I, was a BBC, I would say I was a BBC Amiga guy on the Spectrum ST budget, so I had my beaten up old BBC that cost about as much as the Spectrum, um, and then I had, a, um, I had an Amiga that I found, a shop-soiled Amiga that I found I only paid 200 pounds for, which was kind of an ST amount of money. So I, I got into the Amiga, I think, because my friends had them. And in that playground rivalry, you know, there was always the, oh, well, the ST runs at 8 megahertz, where you only run at 7.1 megahertz. Ah, but we've got a blitter. And, you know, the Amiga was the power machine. Uh, I think people realized it was the power machine. I wanted it. I think I was very lucky to get it because the, the interesting thing about the Amiga, if you compare it to the ST or the BBC, is it's a machine that has other hardware it has non-cpu hardware in it so it has the blitter and it has the copper and it has various other bits and pieces and so you're kind of learning a very different set of lessons when you're getting the most out of an amiga compared to what you're learning when you get when you're getting the most out of a bbc it's fundamentally how few 6502 cycles can you do the thing you want to get done in with an amiga you have a number of different pools of resource you have a fairly powerful processor and then you have some fairly powerful graphics hardware and it's about how do you squeeze how do you use it's not just a scalar optimization problem it's like how do you shuffle this bag of tools you've got in order to get the best outcome and i thought that was really valuable for me it really i guess set me up well for being an embedded engineer later on uh because you know modern the amiga is much more like a, a raspberry pi 
in that you've got a you've got a part powerful processor, but you've got a lot of other stuff. Well, how important were kind of magazines? Because there was no internet back then, so you had to get your resources from somewhere. We saw you quoting Amiga Power on Twitter, so uh, yeah. you must have been a fan of that one. Uh, I mean, everybody loves Amiga Power, right? Uh, magazines were incredibly important because they were the thing that, and you know, talking to other than talking to your friends in the playground, they were the thing that created a sense of community around your platform. I mean, Raspberry Pi has this massive community around it, but it's a community that's enabled by modern communications technology, enabled by the internet. Your your printed magazines, disc magazines. I mean, I even used to send off sometimes for disc magazines or contribute to disc magazines, and so you could mail a disc to somebody and they would copy their magazine onto it. Uh, and send it back to you. I, I used to subscribe to one in New Zealand, whose name I can't remember. I'm really annoyed by it because I really want to find out because I had some stuff printed in it. Um, but I used to subscribe to a New Zealand disc magazine. Very important. And of course, so of the Amiga magazines, Amiga Power was, in my mind, the, the king. I used to read the one as well, but Amiga Power, because it just had a good attitude. Um, and what we tried to do, um, you may know we publish a magazine at Raspberry Pi, we publish a magazine called Wireframe, which is a, a games magazine with a, traditional games magazine but it has a bit of an angle towards development and quite a lot of the um the kind of philosophy and the style of the magazine draws inspiration from amiga power and from your sinclair and obviously i mean talking about disc mags that kind of spins onto the demo scene as well that was obviously huge on the amiga were you into that much at all and did you ever contribute to demos um i wasn't and a lot of that is because i I wasn't connected to anyone who did demos so i was aware of demos and you'd see them sometimes on a cover disc um, but I wasn't really connected to the demo scene. I wasn't able to travel. And the demo scene's often been about travel, you know, particularly to Scandinavia. Uh, I was a bit young for that. Um, and so I wasn't into the demo scene. I had a friend at um, university guy called Alex Evans um, who was statics. So his demo scene handled the statics. Um, and that was really my first exposure. He went on to found Media Molecule. So he's the guy who did Sackboy and now Dreams. Uh, yeah, he was kind of hanging out with Alex was the first time that I really met a proper demo scene person and got an idea of what that was like. But by that time, I was, you know, I was, I was at university. I had other, other things to do. And perhaps my, my kind of hardcore hacking days were a little bit behind me. Did um, watching demos and kind of seeing some of the coding behind it uh, inspire you, though? Yes, no, absolutely. And it still does. I mean, if you go look at, um, there's a demo crew, I guess, called BitShifters, um, yeah, who do yeah. stuff on the BBC. Uh, and some of that stuff's absolutely incredible. You know, they're rec- uh, recreating Atari ST demos on the BBC Micro. And you would never know, right? You know, it's, you know people are still finding ways to squeeze power out of these old platforms. Uh, I've seen some uh, Teletext demos recently, mm. um, which are absolutely yeah. crazy to see on the BBC. Yes. Have you guys come across the, um, have you guys come across BBC Microbot? Uh, no, I've not oh, seen that. There's a Twitter account called BBC Microbot which you can tweet it a, a BBC basic program and it will uh, tweet you back a video of 10 seconds, I think 10 seconds of your program running. And there's a whole demo scene. It's kind of a demo scene around this. Um, what can you, because of course you've got the additional constraint. Your program has to fit into a tweet. Well, after the Amiga, I mean, I remember moving on to my first Windows PC and, you know, that, that wasn't a very happy time. I remember thinking, oh, this is a bit of a dull machine. You know, the, it hasn't got as much personality as my Amiga. What can happen with you then after your Amiga? Did you move on to Windows boxes and that as well? Um, I, I worked for IBM for a year. So I slightly esoterically, I went on to OS2 boxes. Uh, nice. I had an OS2 era. Um, but yeah, I mean, PCs, uh, PCs after the, uh, I guess, probably PCs after the Amiga, a bit of DOS 4GW, DOS extender hacking. That was good fun. And uh, yeah, a lot of lot of Windows, a lot of Windows stuff. And of course, the interesting thing with the PC is the PC has evolved to be more Amiga-like. In that, when I got involved with the PC, what did the PC had? It had an incredibly powerful processor. It was just it was like a BBC Micro. It just had a very powerful processor. It had no real co-processor support, but it was such a powerful processor. By the time you got to kind of a four eight six or a Pentium, it was such a powerful processor that it was able to kind of by brute force overwhelm the hardware advantages that an Amiga had. So, you know, the Amiga died. And then, of course, what's happened over time is that the PC has become a platform with much more ubiquitous um, sort of special purpose uh, processing stuff. So, you know, graphics cards appeared. 2D accelerators, 3D accelerators, video encoder, decode accelerators. And so you've ended up in a world where, which is very, very familiar to somebody who's come from, come from that background. But yeah, I had a, I had a period with, a, I had a 486 and I had a Pentium 133 from tiny computers just like the shabbiest 
uh, just the shabbiest Pentium, the cheapest Pentium 133 box I could buy. Did you kind of see the computer scene as changing in the 90s, uh, you know, when it went on from bedroom to and kind of less hobbyist to a, a more of a professional style, but also more homogenous, the same yeah. machines, the same systems? Yeah, I mean, I think that, that disappearance of that passion, I mean, people still have passion about whether they have a PlayStation or whether they have an Xbox. But even then, actually, most of they're so similar in terms of pieces of hardware that, and the same stuff runs on them. That it's kind of hard to sustain fanboyism about, about modern hardware. So there is kind of a there's sort of a disappearance of passion, I think, a little bit. Um, obviously, a disappearance of programmability, um, either platforms like the PC where you have to choose to be a programmer or platforms like consoles where you're not allowed to choose to be a programmer. Um, so that was sad. And at the time, we didn't really realize what we were losing because we lost it very gradually. Uh, and really kind of the Raspberry Pi story is is about us waking up 10 years later and going, hang on a second, there are no undergraduate computer scientists anymore. What happened? Because I remember, you know, from starting school in the late 80s to by the time we got, you know, 10 years later into the, the mid to late 90s, by then we were learning, you know, Microsoft Word and Excel and it wasn't so much programming anymore. And I, you often wonder if we kind of lost a generation of programmers because of that kind of IT era in schools. Yeah, we, I, I mean, I think we did. Um, I, I think it's important not to not to over lionize what computing education was like in the eighties, because uh, actually, computer education in the eighties mostly consisted of leaving a BBC micro in the corner of a room and seeing if anyone used it, and occasionally, a, if you were very lucky. And I was lucky at both my middle and my upper schools uh, to have a teacher who was very excited about it and so you were very 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 dependent but there was still the possibility of luck i think we went through an era where kind of ict kind of beat the it just beat the fun out particularly because a lot of the stuff that they were uh you know was it was simultaneously not a very taxing subject and also one of the subjects rated most boring by children because they managed to make screwing around with computers uh, into a boring subject which is quite an achievement really uh, because partly because they will just learn the same thing year in year out. So you know, once you've learned to use PowerPoint, you've learned to use PowerPoint. A, you can probably figure it out yourself, and B, you don't need to learn it every year for ten years. And so, so we kind of beat the fun out of it a little bit. And that's why it was so exciting when the last government, the coalition government, just woke up one day and said, "Okay, enough is enough. We're going to turn this one off. This is this is such a terrible subject. We're going to just turn it off and then go away and think about what to do." We're not even going to think about what to do and then replace it. We're just going to scrap it and then worry about what we do next. Well, was the Raspberry Pi an attempt to kind of recreate those hobbyist days, but also engage those pupils? Uh, for me, originally, it was just about the hobbyism, right? Um, the, the kind of engagement with formal education came later. And I think it came as a result, A, of us having more capability because we sold a bunch of Raspberry Pi, so we made some money. But it also came because we started to take a more clear-eyed view of how you reach everybody of how you get rid of that luck fact that there'll always be luck, right? You know, always, you know, if you have an, in any subject, if you happen to have an inspirational teacher, you're going to have a much better experience than if you have just a workman like one. Um, but I think what we were lacking before was uh, any kind of baseline, any kind of, you know, you know, if you go to school, you're going to learn some maths. Uh, might not learn it from a great teacher, but you're going to learn some maths. Uh, we didn't have that with computing. And so kind of like a lot for me, the reason why I've been excited about engagement with um, formal education has been about establishing that baseline and any luck you get on top of that or anything we can arrange in terms of an after school, you know, we can arrange some luck for you. We can arrange for you to have a great after, after school club to go to. But any luck that happens is on top of a baseline that's been provided by the formal system. Well, how did you get the Raspberry Pi idea moving then and actually go from, you know, thinking up the concept to getting it into production? What was that process like? Oh, um, we built a lot of prototypes. So... So the kind of the abbreviated story is I built a lot of prototypes and I went around and I talked to a lot of people about how important this is, um, how we should do it. Um, I had a prototype in 2008, which actually booted into Python. So it was quite it was an interesting device, right? It booted into Python in the same way. So it wasn't a Linux box. It was a Python box. Um, and that was where that was the point where we incorporated the foundation. So a group of us at the University in Cambridge incorporated the foundation. And started plugging away. And for a variety of reasons, that, that device turned out not to be the device. I think it's very hard if you have this kind of closed platform. You have to build everything yourself. We're writing our own SD card drives and our own file system and our own text editor. Um, so you end up kind of pushing a, a small team, ends up pushing a lot of water uphill. 
So probably 2008 to 2010, we wrestled them. 2010, we got our hands on a chip that had an ARM processor in it. That let us run Linux, which let us leverage all of the goodness of the, of the Linux ecosystem. And then, so we're sort of sitting there in 2011 with something we, we think we can build and we think is going to be successful and an idea that we could build a thousand of them and get them into the hands of the right thousand kids. And then we, and we really wanted to call it BBC Micro, really badly wanted to call it BBC Micro. And so we kept going to the BBC and saying, come on, let us stick your name on this. You've got this great brand that's associated. We don't want any money. We, we, we don't want to give you money. We don't want you to give us money. You've got a great brand that's associated with um, computing education. And we've got a great piece of technology. We should put them together. Uh, and we could not get the BBC interested at all. And what we did as our kind of Hail Mary shot was we um, went to see Rory Kethlin Jones at the BBC. And we said, hey, you know, how about it? And he said, well, it's not my department, but I, it's interesting. Can I stick it on my blog? And he stuck it on his blog. And we got this vast amount of interest. Uh, and that, so that was sort of May of 2011. And then we spent 2011, Pete, uh, Pete Lomas and I, Pete designed the hardware and I did the kind of some of the software and business model stuff, spent 2011 figuring out how to make it real, having kind of shot our mouths off and said we can make a $25 computer. Uh, we had we kind of got called on it, really. Um, and then so we spent a lot of time trying to figure out how to, how to make it work. And then we got it in the market in the first quarter. We'd said we'd wanted to get it done by the end of 2011. Uh, we ended up doing it on the 29th, launching on the 29th of February, 2012. So we launched it weirdly. We launched it. wasn't a plan. Uh, we launched on a leap day and took 100,000 orders on the first day. So it was kind of a weird, my best leap day yet. Wow, and where did the name come from then? Uh, so when we had the when we when we booted into Pi into Python, um, we f- thought we needed a name that evoked. We wanted a name that evoked classic computer companies, and of course, fruit is quite central to the naming of classic computer companies. Uh, you know, apricot, tangerine, uh, acorn, even is a fruit. Uh, one or two others, I think, around. So we wanted a fruit, and there aren't that many fruit left. And also, raspberry is um, blowing a raspberry. That was on purpose. And you know, Roald Dahl had this idea that the funniest thing that happens to kids for a child is if an adult farts. Uh, <laughs> and so we thought, hey, rub, you know, raspberry. And the, the, the funniest, I think he thought the funniest thing that could happen at all would be if the queen were to fart. Um, uh, and um, so, so, yeah, we thought raspberry would be fun. Uh, and then pi is Python. And it's P-I, not P-Y, because we thought that the, the letter, the Greek letter pi would be a good, uh, would be a good logo. And in the end, we didn't use that. We have a picture of a raspberry as our logo. But uh, it was by that time, we, things were, by the time we'd moved on to a, from a, a Python box whose logo was going to be the Greek letter Pi to a Linux box whose logo was a picture of a raspberry, uh, the name of the organization and the name of the product had long been fixed. Um, that's a good name, actually. I'm really pleased. I'm really pleased with it. But I think there was some skepticism early on as to whether people would embrace something with such a silly name. Uh, we didn't mean. We, I think we've got a lovely brand, and we've got a brand which is really iconic and and is is recognised by people who are in this area. Um, but we never wanted to have a brand. We wanted to be a BBC Micro, and of course, you know, being with BBC Micro wasn't an unalloyed benefit for Acorn. I don't think. You know, I think they they felt that it it, it subsumed their own brand. It kind of crushed the Acorn brand. That no one thinks of it as the Acorn BBC Micro. They think of it as the BBC Micro. And then when they did the Acorn Archimedes, they, they, they struggled to leverage the success they'd had with the BBC into a new generation of hardware because they didn't have the name anymore. But uh, yeah, it's worked out well for us. But it was very unintentional. Because I remember, you know, when I first saw the Raspberry Pi, the fact that it had the ARM processor in there, that did kind of feel like a continuation of the Archimedes. Yeah. I mean, was the kind of a lot of that kind of legacy in the design of it then, and were you? really inspired by the work that Acorn had done before? Yeah, we were completely inspired by the work Acorn had done. I mean, the first thing I did when we had prototypes, the, one of the very, very first prototypes went into the hands of the Riscos, uh, uh, Riscos Open Limited to get Riscos running. Getting Riscos running on it was a really important goal for me. I mean, I'd spent a childhood, my second half of my childhood, kind of drooling over the Archimedes at school, you know, the one Archimedes that my school could afford. And uh, yeah, being able to run, yeah, we're the biggest by far the largest ever supplier of RISCOS compatible hardware. Uh, and there's there's something fun about that, right? And it's it's interesting because RISCOS seemed to kind of disappear as well. And, uh, you know, we've always been told, being in the computer community, that ARM is the future. And it's good to actually see it being implemented and, and, and becoming so popular. Yeah, we're really keen to tell. Obviously, you know, ARM has had enormous success in a lot of areas. Um, uh, but it's never really cut through in desktop in computers 
you know, cuts through mobile phones and embedded systems and, and all sorts of other places and servers are increasingly now, but never in client. Uh, and really, you know, um, this kind of quixotic thing we've always done where we've beaten our heads against making ARM work in the client, in the general purpose client space. Um, and then Raspberry Pi 4 is a lovely ARM-based PC. Uh, we're really, really proud of it. Well, obviously, the Raspberry Pi, like you said, it was designed originally as a hobbyist machine, then the educational market it was aimed at too. Were you surprised when its popularity broke out into the general public and people just started buying them, you know, as media centres and just just to own them? I mean, I've probably got a drawer full of Raspberry Pis here because they're so affordable. You think, oh, I'll get the latest model. Are you surprised at how much it's become a success? Yeah, I'm surprised at how much it's become a, 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 a mass market success. You know, that there are people who wouldn't consider themselves to be deeply technical buying. There have been people who of that sort buying Raspberry Pis, yeah, as you said, media centers or retro gaming setups for a long time. And the interesting thing, of course, that's happened over the last few months is you have people buying them to use as their computer, as their child's computer uh, at home um, during the lockdown. Um, you had a lot of people setting them up for home, home, home working or homeschooling. Um, and that was that's that was that was what was really nice is we only really got there last June, so really only Raspberry Pi three wouldn't have been a suitable COVID PC, but Raspberry Pi four is. So we kind of we got there in the nick of time, I think, for that opportunity. Do you find it interesting that a kind of secondary market's been created with like um, laptops that you could put your pies inside, uh, different cases, adapters, yeah. all kinds of devices for it as well? Yeah, it's wonderful. I mean, it's really wonderful. I, I, I can't, yeah, I can't express how wonderful it is. Actually, it's, it's because you know we know some of the people doing this, and it's, it's creating employment, it's creating businesses. People have built. You look at Pi Hut, you look at Pimeroni, um, you know, you look at these, you know, Pi Supply. You look at all of these businesses that have either grown up because of the Pi or that existed before the Pi and have had the opportunity to grow because of the Pi. I mean, we you know for companies, very established companies like Adafruit. Um, you know, we've been an important part of their growth, important part of their growth story. And that's, that's super exciting, right? Because we want to have a nice economy to keep us going, you know? Um, and, uh, you know, the, the fact that people are small businesses, small businesses are super exciting, right? I mean, the creativity of small businesses is amazing. Just having been part of that and having enabled that is, is it's a big deal for me. And I imagine the affordability of the Raspberry Pi has obviously been a big part of its success. I mean, what were kind of the challenges in that design process of keeping it so affordable and was that one of your main priorities to keep it at that low price point uh it was a priority early on because we announced the price before we knew we could make it we had a very back of an envelope calculation that said we could make it but it was really when i say back of an envelope i mean add up the four or five most expensive bits memory processor network um and pcb uh and convince yourself that's a lot less than 25 35 dollars and then wave your hands and say yeah we can make it so yeah, it was it was very important early on, and really that was just done by relentless making every component on the board pay for itself. You know, really throwing out anything that you could conceivably throw out. Um, when I saw the Raspberry Pi Zero on the front cover of Magpie magazine, that was like a game changer for me. So I, mean, I remember the days of being impressed when you got a, a floppy disk or a yeah. cassette tape on the front of a magazine. Never mind a computer. Yeah, and we, and we, so we once we realised we could do that, we sort of felt we couldn't. We couldn't not do it, you know, that there was no way that we could pass up the opportunity because, you know, you've got the magazine, you have a device that you can afford to put on the cover, you're going to do it. Other than launch day, other than leap day in 2012, the day that we put Raspberry Pi Zero on the front cover of the Magpie and watched, sat back and watched the almost kind of civil insurrection in Smith's uh, over the course of a day, that was that's probably the standout memory. For me, of Raspberry Pi, I'd love to find another a way to do something equally weird and impactful. But it's been nearly five years now, and I don't think we've I don't think we've thought of anything that's that devious. And we had a hundred percent sell through, and magazines never. I mean, I think we had ninety nine point eight percent sell through or something. I think there was a box somewhere in the Smiths, in the back of the Smiths that didn't get put out. But yeah, we had this incredible sell through number, and magazines just never sell through like that. Uh, you know, uh, so it was it was it was good. And it's a nice little product. People still, people still, the Zero W obviously, I think now gets most of the limelight, the wireless enabled one. Um, but Zero is still a lovely little product if you just need a thing to glue two things together and then talk to a telly. Uh, it's a nice, it's a nice product. Well, the thing I love about it as well is that it can be used as a co-processor. So instead of being like 
the main machine. It can help other machines like the original BBC, but also new machines like the Spectrum Next. Was this a function that you initially envisioned? Uh, no, no, it wasn't. So Dominic Plunkett, who's one of our employees at, at Raspberry Pi, has been very involved in the um, the Pi Tube uh, stuff. Uh, and it's great because it gives you an equivalently, I forget what the number is, it's a few hundred megahertz of six, when you run a 6502 emulator on it, it gives you a two or 300 megahertz 6502 Copro for your beep, <laughs> which is actually people trying to run beep elite on it and stuff. So that's kind of, that's fun. Um, yeah, the, 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 the Spectrum X thing was, was a surprise. Uh, and it's just, it's what happens if you, if you put a, it was interesting, it was surprising to me how well suited some bits of the GPIO hardware on the Pi were to, to implementing the tube protocol. I think we got very lucky with the design of the, the processor in the Pi and the design of the tube protocol that they fit together very well. Uh, but yeah, I didn't see it coming. Well, a couple of years ago, the Raspberry Pi took the crown from the Commodore 64 as the biggest selling single model of computer in history, which, you know, the, the Commodore 64 held that record for about 30 years, I believe. I mean, was that a proud moment when that happened? It was. And of course, the, the, when we say single model, it's, it's always a bit blurry because the C64, okay, there were board revisions um, and some of the numbers add C65s and 128s in there. But, um, and you have to deal with Jack Tramiel's natural exaggerating tendencies as well when you're trying to think yeah. about what the number is. And obviously to get to that, you have to add together all the pies, so the various models of Pi. So there's sort of a, a sense in which uh, the, the, the C64's number is purer than our number. But what's actually happened, the interesting thing that's happening is Pi 3 on its own is catching up. So, you know, if we say that 12 million is the number for the most credible number for C64, Pi 3 itself is north of 10 million, just that one model. So I think we're probably going to have a moment where a single model, a single isolated model of Pi overhauls the C64 because because Pi 3 is still selling. Although you know, we've had 3 Plus and we've had 4. For some industrial customers, 3 is exactly the product they want. Uh, and I think I can see our way to selling another 2 million of them over the next two or three years. Well, what's the connection between the Raspberry Pi and Cambridge? Because I know you've got a retail store there as well. And how important was it to have that kind of retail presence? The connection is... We live here, <laughs> and the people who did it are mostly Cambridge people, although Pete, Pete Lomas, who I mentioned, interestingly isn't. He's based up in Cheshire. So it was designed, rather, the original Raspberry Pi wasn't designed in Cambridge, it was designed in Cheshire. But, yeah, I mean, Cambridge has got this long history, right? It's Turing's University, it's where Babbage was before he built the analytical engine. We have a, a long history of building weird and wonderful computers here. So, so it's kind of a natural place. And, of course, the 1980s machines tended to come from Cambridge. Uh, you know, the, the B band, the Spectrum, were both Cambridge machines. Uh, so, so there's sort of a nat naturalness to it with Cambridge. In terms of the shop, um, I think we just want to get co closer to our customers. And it's a, it's a slice of our customers, right? I mean, Cambridge is a special place, and its inhabitants are special. Um, and, and it would be a mistake to try and draw, uncritically draw conclusions from talking to people in Cambridge. Uh, about how they interact with the pie. But you know, we were very remote from our customers for a long time. And the store has been really useful for us in helping understand the customers. And we have products, we have particularly kitting products out there that we wouldn't have if it wasn't for the store. So the desktop kit, the Raspberry Pi 4 desktop kit, wouldn't exist if it wasn't for the feedback we'd had from customers in the store. Well, the Raspberry Pi obviously sees a lot of uses in retro computing. I mean, I've got one inside a monster joystick mm. that works as a great little arcade machine. I've got, you know, Raspberry Pis that serve as dedicated Amiga emulators, for example. I mean, what kind of cool retro uses have you seen for the Pi? The the kind of the broad rebuilds of uh, the, the kind of rebuilds of arcade cabinets and sort of bar bar top uh, machines are always they're always nice to see. I think the, the, the thing that's always nice for me is when we get new generations of Pi to see whether we've pushed the bar forwards because performance is kind of continuous, right? Um, but there are bars you want to get over. So if you want to run, emulate PS1, emulate Amiga, emulate PS2. Um, so, so it's always fun to watch the, watch the bar moving up. And of course, the emulators are getting simultaneously easier and harder to run because they get easier to run because they get optimized and they get harder to run because people over time care more about fidelity. Um, so you look at a modern BBC micro emulator, it's incredibly heavy to run because it really emulates. I think the BBC, you end up emulating down to a half cycle accuracy in order to be able to run every bit shifters down, be able to run elite, 
and Exile and every bit shifter's demo, uh, you end up consuming enormous amounts of, uh, of performance. But yeah, I, I just I, I love to see it because a lot of these platforms, you know, they'll die out if, in the memory of them. They were amazing platforms. They had amazing content on them and they had amazing communities around them. And, and that will die out. They, you know, they, they're not going to, you know, your world of SNES mini you know, NES Mini, uh, uh, play PS1 Classic, um, those kind of uh, point things where the you know where the platform owners go and try and uh, and sweat out a little bit more value out of their platform, that won't sustain a community in the way that emulation does. And I love the fact as well that you can you know I can have an arcade machine inside a joystick and take it around my friend's house and plug it into his TV and you've got all these games that you know you, when you were a kid you would never dream that you could play these at home yeah and, and you have people the nice thing about the the um, the hardware I mean you've got a lot of people who take their legal obligations very seriously right so you know I think there's a lot of the most serious people aren't just going around torrenting um, aren't just going around torrenting images they're actually making sure they've got the hardware and there are people I've seen people build um, because the a lot of the the sort of um, fourth, fourth generation, say consoles are, you know, the the cartridge interface is a memory interface. You get people who go around, they try and build widgets to let you plug a cart in and read it from the emulator. So, so actually, you know, skip the step where you've made a copy of the game. Uh, and it's kind of fun that people are still trying to do these, still trying to do these unusual, these unusual things with the platform. It's fantastic. I think my pie's probably been a weather station. A NAS drive, um, a teletext machine. <laughs> There's loads of different kind of applications for it. Have you seen anything really weird that you totally didn't expect it to be used as? I think all of the. I, I mentioned this one too. But I'm going to mention it. So I'm going to mention this one. I mentioned it too much, but I mentioned it because I think it's it's weird. The cucumber sorter is a favorite weird one. Chap in Japan <laughs> who built his parents a cucumber. His parents have a cucumber farm, and he built them a cucumber sorter. A an AI TensorFlow powered cucumber sorter um, that sorts cucumbers based on how green, knobbly, straight, bendy they are into one of twenty five categories. So to help his aging parents not have to hand sort cucumbers anymore, uh, and it's, but it, it sounds frivolous, but it's a really interesting example of uh, how the pie gives you the ability to talk to the real to to gather data from the real world, so from a camera in this case to do some processing. Um, to drive, you know, little fl- little flippers to knock the, the cucumbers off the conveyor belt into the right hopper. So you know, so you're, you're reading data from the world, you're affecting the world, uh, and you're talking back to networks and you're talking to a display. So it's kind of it's a pocket example of Pi as this kind of bit of Lego, this kind of magic bit of glue that sits in the middle of a lot of other things and lets people build the thing they always wanted to build. And I love when you were talking a moment ago about the you know the different emulation uses and the the increasing power enabling more retro platforms to be emulated accurately. I mean, I think you know the Raspberry Pi in no small part has been quite a key thing that's kind of had this retro resurgence that we've had in the last couple of years because it's made emulation so accessible. I mean, why do you think there's been such an interest in retro again in like the last decade or so? Uh, I think we've. It sort of feels a bit like we're. Most modern games are flogging one of a small number of dead horses, and you get unusual standouts. I mean, Dreams, back to sort of some Alex's stuff. Dreams is a good example of something which really isn't flogging a dead horse. Um, But, you know, the vast majority of things fit very neatly into one of a small number of buckets, and what you get every year is this year's incremental improvement to the first-person Second World War-themed shooter. And I think there's something about dipping back into those older games that often have very simple mechanics, very polished, where, where there isn't that much beyond the mechanic. Um, I wrote a, we did a book, this book, um, Code the Classics, and I, um, I wrote a, um, a version of Centipede, which we call Myriapod, for it. And what was fascinating about writing Centipede, again, was that as soon as I built the mechanic, it was perfect. There was no tuning. There was really no tuning. It was just the entire game, the whole of Centipede, just comes down to the right two lines of code that implement how the segments move down the screen. Um, and everything else is, is, is irrelevant. Um, and I think people find that appealing about some of these old games. You know, Mario, old Super Mario Brothers, has just great, it's just so playable and so simple. And people, I think you know, people, it's the same reason why people, why um, mobile gaming has become so important. Um, because people it, people like a venue where the privilege is mechanics over presentation, or certainly mechanics over the insane kind of AAA 
levels of presentation where your game needs to make $100 million to, to, to break even. Have you seen more kids getting into computing then because of the pie? Yes. The, I mean, just looking at the Cambridge application numbers, uh, we have we went from 600 applicants in rough numbers, 600 applicants in 1999, down to 200 applicants in 2008, and that was the that was the pit, um, that was the Nadir, and then back up to over 1400 last year. It's really hard to get into Cambridge to read computer science now. It used to be really went through a window of being really you know easier than most other subjects. It's now the level of competition is incredible. Um, and all the colleges are, you know, the, the, you know, the faculty wants to expand and there's always this pressure. It's like how many more every year, how many more go to the senior tutor, how many more people are you going to let me a bit? Uh, and that's a wonderful position for us to be in. Uh, and they all, you know, they, a lot of them say that they had some involvement with the pie. A lot of them talk about the pie and robotics. So I think the big, un, the big surprising thing for me is that the, the exciting things people do with Raspberry Pi uh, are often physical projects physical computing projects not i thought people were going to use it actually the gpio connector on the pi i wasn't a big fan of putting that on there that was pete you know we have gpio pins on the chip and he's like we should bring these out to a header I'm like, oh really really because people are just going to use this to write demos right you know people are going to you, my idea was that people would use this to write software um and, and dumb luck and pete having a brain uh, meant that we that we have this hardware capability. I think it's great as well that you know you're following in the legacy of these classic companies that we talked about, Sinclair, Acorn, and you know for a while it felt like we didn't really have a you know a British home computer market at least. So it, it must be quite satisfying that you've kind of brought that back to the the mainstream again. It is. I sort of slightly wish that the government might notice that. <laughs> you know. We make them in the UK as well, yeah. right? We make them in Wales. It's not we're not just it's not just you know designed in the UK, made in China. It's we make them in the UK. We design them in the UK in Cambridge, center of high tech design. We manufacture them in South Wales, center of high tech manufacturing. Yeah, I do sometimes wonder whether in some other countries this might not be a bigger thing uh, that that we've done this here. But it's fine. It's fine. You know, we get our fourteen hundred applicants, so we're happy. <laughs> well, Evan, it's been incredible getting your history and uh, talking about the Raspberry Pi as well. I mean, what are your, kind of your future plans and hopes for the project then? Have you got anything in the pipeline that you'd like to do with it? You know, I think there's, well, there's a lot more to do in this country, right? You know, not every school has a code club. Uh, not every teacher has been fully trained yet to, to, to deliver computing. Not every parent realizes that computing is a wonderful opportunity for their child. So there's work to do in the UK. I think there's work to do overseas in the developed world. You know, we sell a lot of units in Germany. We sell a lot of units in North America. And there's a question as to whether it's really moral to kind of take money from countries and not make an investment in trying to help in those countries. So I think there are there are developed world countries. And then the developing world is just an endless source of possibility for the Raspberry Pi. If you think about how many people there are in the developing world who have a television and no computer. And what were those computers? What yeah. were those computers in the nineteen eighties? They were machines for turning your television into a computer. Uh, they were peripherals to your television. Television was the most expensive thing your parents bought, uh, and this was a box. Particularly if it was something like a Spectrum, it was a pretty cheap box. You could plug into it and turn that TV into a whole new thing. And there's an enormous penetration of televisions in the developing world that isn't matched by deployment of of general purpose computers. And, and so there's a wonderful opportunity. I would love to go around Africa. I, mean, I think we we did a we did a, a study, and there were eighty. We could find eighty million televisions of various sorts. It's why it's important the Raspberry Pi can still drive a, an analog telly. Um, but 80 million televisions in the 26 African countries we looked at and virtually no PC penetration at all. So you've got a chance there to go, you know, it wouldn't even be that expensive. Go give everyone in Africa who's got a, a television a computer. And I think they're a wonderful things we can do that. Fantastic, Evan. Well, it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast this week. And uh, we can't wait to see what you do next. Well, thank you very much for having me. And I uh, hope you enjoyed the occasional background outbursts of, uh, of toddler singing and, and uh, <laughs> toddler singing and, and baby yelling. Uh, that's <laughs> nice fine. little snapshot into home life. Indeed. Life in lockdown. <laughs>